All right, I think it's time for us to get started. Thanks for all of you that uh, walked all the way here. I know it's a uh, pretty significant walk, so it's nice that uh, with all your other options, you decide to come here about container D. Um, I'm gonna try and keep the slide portion to a minimum. Um, if you are really interested in a lot more detail on container D architecture and design, uh, I'm gonna briefly kind of overview that, uh, but I'm gonna really focus more on the client API and actually we're gonna build a, a very simple client together and then uh, I'm gonna cheat and jump to like a more complex client that I'm not gonna write live because we don't have a whole lot of time. And we'll, we'll kind of demonstrate some of those capabilities. So that's gonna be the focus. If you, again, if you wanna hear more about architecture and design, uh, Stephen Day, who's here and, and myself have given two or three talks over the last few months. Uh, at least the uh, Moby Summit talk is online, so you can find that and kind of get a deeper dive into architecture. Um, but again, um, I'm one of the maintainers. We have a couple more uh, maintainers here. We've got maintainers from the CRI Container D project here. Um, so if, uh, if everything goes horribly bad up here, we can just chat around about uh, Container D uh, together, but hopefully, uh, you'll get something out of kind of how, how you can actually use Container D uh, in your project uh, for your use case. Um, so why did Container D come about? Uh, Michelle covered a very brief highlight on that um, earlier in the keynotes. Um, again, it, it came out of this desire across the ecosystem for this, this boring, stable infrastructure idea uh, the Docker engine obviously uh, grew with a lot of features and capabilities that wasn't as interesting to the entire ecosystem. And so you saw libcontainer, which was originally part of the Docker engine, got spun out. That's what created the OCI, run C, and, and that work. Um, and then container D was a, a lightweight management layer above that um, that, uh, that became, uh, as of last December, a much uh, more ambitious project. Um, so last December, it was announced that Docker would be spinning out Container D as a separate project, contributing that somewhere in March, that somewhere was announced to be the CNCF at the Berlin KubeCon. Um, so again, the, the intent was here, uh, like Craig said in his tweet, uh, let's create some boring core infrastructure that everyone can use, usable by any higher layer container native uh, orchestration piece. And then more recently, along with that year ago promise, was that the governance model would move away uh, from BDFL. And so uh, as of a few weeks ago, the Moby uh, Technical Steering Committee has been formed. I'm part of that. Uh, if you want, again, more information on that, I'm in the middle of writing a blog post about that that should be out soon. Uh, but again, these are all the pieces. Boring core con uh, container infrastructure, uh, governance that's open, uh, contributed to CNCF, and so that's really why we have Container D today. Um, who's using it today? Uh, there are a, a few kind of core use cases already um, using it actively. We, we've talked to a lot of people who are kind of earlier, earlier on, which I'm not going to talk about here, but hopefully we'll see this list grow. Uh, obviously, a very important use case is CRI Container D, uh, implementing that container runtime interface. Uh, so Kubernetes can use Container D as its uh, kubelet runtime. Uh, Linux Kit, the project out of the, the Moby uh, project for a minimal secure uh, OS image assembler, uses Container D as its core runtime. And again, higher layers can use that. So if you build Linux Kit, build a Kubernetes uh, assembly, uh, it will actually use Container D as the runtime. Uh, build Kit is a new project. There's a great blog post. Uh, from Tanis, uh, one of the Docker engineers who assembled BuildKit, again, a container image construction um, uh, builder that's separate from Docker and can use Containerd directly. And then obviously the Docker engine itself, as Containerd has moved from that, uh, that earlier version into the full 1.0 version, uh, you'll see 17.12 if, if we're talking Docker CE versions and above will be using this Container 1.0 code base. So that's really where you see uh, Container D used today. As I said, I'm not gonna try and unpack this whole architecture. Um, there's a couple things that are important to, to say here. 
Uh, one is that, that the container D architecture really applies a lot of the learnings from the history of the Docker engine, all the OCI work. Um, so a lot of the, the, the concepts used in container D are either, hey, this didn't work so well in the early versions of the Docker engine, let's try and do that better. So the snapshotter um, model um, is very powerful. Uh, the graph drivers were very tangled in with the rest of the engine. The snapshotter uh, design is much clearer. Again, if you want more on that, we can provide more resources. And then using known good technology, um, again, using the OCI runtime underneath, using gRPC, exporting metrics with Prometheus, and not opinionated toward a specific platform. So Docker Engine can use it and add its opinionated kind of capabilities on top. Kubernetes can use it. Um, but again, I'm gonna you know, skip over um, you know, a lot of the detail here, and we're gonna jump into actually using uh, the API, which will bring out some more of these components um, in a more you know, hands-on fashion. Um, the API, I think, has been kind of one of the shining examples of uh, what Container D has done to apply some of the learnings of, of the earlier runtimes. One was to have an API that was simple and clear um, had stability guarantees, again, using gRPC and protobuf you know, versioning, we can provide that now. So container D1.0 is out. Um, so now the, the API is versioned. You can guarantee to use that API. We have CI tests that make sure it doesn't break. And it's also, the API uses a pass-through model. So you know, we're not trying to abstract the whole OCI uh, JSON configuration. So that if it changes, then we have to change um, so it, it gives uh, our API more of, you know, just that lightweight metadata and passing through the OCI config to the OCI runtime. And then, of course, we have the Godoc published, uh, which gives you, you know, a nice way to learn about the API and, and we'll provide those links as well. And a couple, you know, folk early responses were just, you know, this is a great API, love it, clean, um, you know, and, and that's, that's important for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so, we are uh, doing fairly well on time. What I'm gonna do is switch to an editor that has a skeleton of what I wanna do. Um, you can go to this GitHub um, repository, example CTR, under my GitHub ID. You can see the finished um, example there. Um, but the part we're gonna code is just quite simple. We're gonna connect to the daemon, we're gonna pull an image, create a container and start the task. I'm also gonna set a namespace. Again, one of the nice features of container D is namespacing, similar to uh, the Kubernetes model of, you know, when I set my namespace, now I only see resources associated with that namespace. Uh, so let's try this out. So here I've, is the font gonna be okay for folks in the back? All right. Um, if not, there are some seats further forward. Uh, what I'm gonna do first of all is we're gonna have to connect to the Unix socket uh, where container D is listening. So I'm just gonna set that as a, a const. So run container D, container D.soc is gonna be my default address. I'm gonna set a, uh, a default uh, image that I'm gonna pull and run uh, again, container D is not opinionated, so it's not gonna add in uh, Docker Hub or the tag, so I have to provide all of that. So I'm gonna talk to Docker Hub, one of the library image images. I'm gonna run the Redis uh, Alpine tag. Um, so those are just some defaults that'll help me out. To connect to the daemon, very simply, I provided the address. So that's the address I'm gonna Connect to, that's gonna to return to me a client. And who wants to see me put in error handling on every single call? That'll be fun, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. If you're coding Go, it, it's painful to skip this. Um, so we'll do that. I couldn't connect. And here's my error. And we'll go away. So that's all we had to do to connect to container D. 
uh, fairly straightforward. I now want to set a namespace. I need another import for that from the uh, namespaces package. And so namespaces with namespace. Um, we'll do context background. And let's just call it example CTR. And that will return the context that I'm now going to use for all the rest of the API calls. So at this point, I want to pull this image that I've already talked about. Uh, one of the things I'll do with my client is I'm first going to say get image with this context, the, the name of the image, the reference to it. Um, because it's possible in this namespace, I've already pulled the image. So this obviously won't talk to Docker Hub and pull the layers and manifest. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit and just assume that if I get an error, it means it's not pulled. So I'll actually um, do pull image. Again, uh, fairly straightforward. I'm going to pull that image. And I'm going to provide a um, with, uh, with pull unpack, which means that container D, the snapshotter, is going to unpack these layers uh, of my image. Um, if I get an error at this point, we're probably going to have to just get out of here because that means I couldn't even get the image, couldn't pull image any error. So at this point, I've connected to my client. I've set my namespace. I've pulled an image. Uh, the next thing I want to do is create a container. And this, again, is, is a fairly straightforward context, uh, kind of a container ID. Uh, I'll call it example CTR. Uh, now the interesting thing is I, I have a set of, if you look in the Go doc, you'll find a bunch of kind of with helpers, container D with. Um, and one of the things we're going to want is a, um, a snapshot. I'm sorry, with new snapshot. So that means that uh, now my image is unpacked in the snapshot driver, in this case, the overlay. So if you use Docker, graph driver, the overlay two driver, that's your default in container D. So now I'm saying my root file system, I want that to be um, based on a new snapshot that I'm going to call uh, example CTR, and the parent will be this image that I've that I've just pulled. Um, the next thing I need to do. So if you've if you've looked at Run C or, or the OCI runtime spec, you know that to run a container, I need two pieces of information. I've now uh, provided kind of this root file system with the snapshotter. I also need a OCI runtime config. That's the JSON file that has you know, what, what uh, program is going to be run, what namespaces, Linux kernel namespaces I'm going to isolate in. All, all those settings are within the OCI config. That's bound up in the image, so there's a nice helper uh, that I can use to, I'm sorry, I actually need the uh, OCI package here because we're going to basically uh, say OCI with image config and not make any modifications to it. Um, and so we'll just be, this Redis Alpine image already says, you know, its configuration is in, in its image. So let's do uh, with, actually I need um, to tell container D, I want a new spec. And here's where I'm using the OCI. Um, uh, ima uh, with image config and the image. Who thinks that's right? Oh, yep. Thank you. Yeah. See, this is fun, isn't it? If you want to see this done well, uh, look at any Liz Rice talk on YouTube. This is my Liz Rice impersonation talk. 
Um, all right, so uh, new container uh, with new snapshot, with new spec, OCI, with image config, and what do I still have wrong? Yep. Okay. Well, that was a, a little more fun. What in the world just happened there? I think I did a, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so we have a container. That was a little more uh, exciting. But at this point, uh, we don't, obviously we don't have a task. We don't have a running container. This is just the, the metadata is now set up. Um, let's make sure we have a, a reasonable container object before we go on. All right, so at this point we have the container. Um, at this point we are going to use that container to create a task and this is uh, fairly straightforward. I'm gonna create it so I don't care about the output. So um, again, we need a new package. Uh, CIO is container, it's not about the, uh, the person in your company, uh, the chief information officer, it's about container D's IO. Um, and so when I create this task, I'm basically saying, I don't care about standard in, standard error, standard out, uh, just get rid of it for me, pipe it to dev null. Uh, this will create a task object. And couldn't create task. So we have one step left. Um, we are actually going to start this task. And this doesn't require anything other than the context. Um, and we're just going to check and make sure that it actually started. Um, And couldn't start task. And actually, um, we should really delete the task. And we should really delete the container at this point. That makes it easier. We can obviously go, um, this one I always forget, with Snapshot cleanup, yes. So that means that that root file system I assembled uh, will actually get cleaned up and deleted so I don't have to use the, the snapshot tooling to go do that. And I really should have uh, done this as well here, just to make it cleaner. All right, so in you know 60 lines of code, we've connected to container D, We've uh, set up a namespace, pulled an image, um, created a container, created a task, and started it. Who believes this uh, will actually run? Any votes? <laughs> All right. All right, so I call this file skeleton.go. I've already vendored in uh, everything into, into this project. Uh, again, you can see this on GitHub under examplectr.go. Uh, I didn't want to check in the blank skeleton, so I just created that for this. All right, that's built. Uh, you can see I already have containerd running here. This is uh, version 1.0 that we just released a few days ago. I'm pseudoing because I need to talk to containerd's socket, daemon socket, which is protected by root. Um, all right, obviously we didn't output anything because we, we nulled all the information, but we should have a started um, container. Sure enough, example CTR. Um, if you wonder why I didn't have to say anything about the namespace, I've already put that in a variable in my environment. So container D underscore namespace, so I didn't have to type, I could have typed dash namespace, example CTR, and seen the same container, it's running the Redis Alpine image. If we look at tasks, 
uh, we should actually see that there's one running. If we PS on this system, uh, you'll see that Redis server is actually running. Okay, so we wrote a container D simple client. Uh, it actually worked, it started a container. Uh, hopefully you see again just the simplicity uh, of the API and how simple it was to assemble that uh, quickly. I'm going to stop the task with the, C again, CTR is a simple command line tool. It's not really something we officially see as part of the container D um, promises about stability, but obviously for administrative tasks, uh, it's quite easy to use. So again, I can uh, stop my Redis server. Sorry, I can kill my Redis server task and I can remove that container and you can see that it's gone. Um, let's go back to the slides for just a second um, because I have an advanced example that I, as I mentioned, um, I'm not gonna have time to you know, add these other API calls, so I've, I've done it for you. We'll look at the code and then we'll, then we'll run it. Uh, but we added some more concepts to the containerd client. Um, if you know that I've worked on user namespaces in various uh, container runtime contexts, you're not gonna get out of here without a, a user namespace example. So I've added that to, uh, to, this, um, to this example. I've also added a with helper in my own code. So again, we use some with helpers that containerd provided us. Now I'm gonna add my own with helper to do a, a bind mount for my host. And then we can also do things like an optional custom command to override the image config. So, you know, if you do docker run in some image and a command, uh, it runs that command instead of uh, the default one in the image. So we've added that uh, to this example. So let's go back to our editor. Let's look at advanced. Um, I'll try and skip over the, this is the ugliness that gets produced when you don't use a flag parsing library. I thought it would be easy and then it got really ugly. So don't follow this example. Use a nice uh, 2E library for that. Um, what I've done is I've, I've basically said when you call my example CTR, uh, now you're gonna provide a username. I'm gonna look up um, to see if that username has any sub UIDs and GIDs. So if you know anything about user namespaces, uh, that'll give me some ranges that I can then uh, that I can then apply to the container config, uh, and then obviously I've let you specify an image and a command. Um, you can see here I'm using a package that I just copied over from uh, the Moby project that I wrote when I originally did user namespaces. So the ID tools, uh, new ID mappings, just does that look into sub UID and sub GID and gives me those mappings. Uh, a bunch of this is the same, obviously, connecting, setting my namespace. I've created a, a small uh, object so I can have this run container function and not have to pass around all the client and context. But you can see the same things are happening. Getting an image, pulling an image, creating a container, uh, creating a task. Creating a task got a little more interesting because now I actually want to modify the OCI config to add in the user namespace uh, configuration. Uh, actually, in this case, sorry, the task, I need to tell uh, run C, by the way, don't, don't uh, make the IOs owned by root or else you know, my user namespace process won't be able to read that. We'll look at new container, which actually does the other thing I was about to, to mention. But once we've done that, all we're doing is creating the task and uh, checking for exit status, because now if you give me a custom command, I wanna know that it actually ran and give you the output. So again, this client is, is a little more um, involved. Here's the part I meant to talk about. So here uh, from line 175 uh, to, uh, and below, I'm actually saying, did I find some ID mappings for this user? Okay, if so, let me grab those maps and pass it uh, into the OCI helper with user namespace. And so again, at this point, I'm modifying that image's default OCI config to add the user namespace options. Um, and then again, we pass that spec on and actually create the container uh, the same way we did before. 
All right, so hopefully that wasn't too, too much of a whirlwind uh, tour through that. Uh, again, this is all in that GitHub project, so you can look at this at your own leisure. Um, I've already built um, this example CTR2. Uh, I've called it example CTR2 here. Um, again, I need to sudo that. SSP is my local user. I know I have UID maps already on the system for that. Um, I can provide, let's, let's just run Alpine latest. And we can do, actually let's run it like this first because then we, we, you can actually, we can verify that it's running in a user namespace. So let's try this out. Um, oh yeah, Alpine latest isn't pulled. So it's actually pulling Alpine latest over conference Wi-Fi, which shouldn't take too long. <laughs> I, yes, I am a gambler. Um, images LS, it looks like it's there. So, oh. Oh, you know what? Don't pay attention to any of this. Um, yes, you'll find out in a minute why, um, why I had to do this, but this container D um, path was modified. Uh, because in a minute, I'm gonna run this inside Linux kit. Uh, hopefully we're gonna have time to, to wrap that up. Um, uh, and I had to run a separate container D because we're working on a bug with user namespaces inside Linux kit. So I had to point it at a different. So let's try this again. All right, so now we have a running container. If I look at the task, uh, there's its PID. If I grep 31698 out of aux, you can see that UID 100,000 is running the shell in this Alpine container. Okay, so simple enough. We now ran a container with user namespaces using my advanced, quote unquote, advanced client. Um, and that was easy enough. Um, let's actually get rid of this task and delete the container. As you can see, I also added um, something to the ID so I can run more than one container and not clash on the name. That's just the PID of, of the example CTR. Um, so the other thing I talked about, let's look back at the editor for a second. I have a utils um, program, utils. Uh, it has a couple more tools. You could build out your client a little more with stop, delete, so again, you don't have to use the CTR tool for that. But here I've added with mounts. Um, and the way I've done this, just for demo purposes, is I actually look for a file in the local directory called mounts. I expect that inside it I'll have a target, the type of mount, like bind, and the destination. And then I'll, I'll basically modify the OCI spec. So you can see at the end here I'm appending a new mount to the specs mount. So this is my own with mounts helper that I've created. So now my client has the ability uh, to do mounts. And let's just, uh, actually I think I already had a mounts file here in the local directory. I'm gonna mount Etsy host, uh, bind mount that. Let's, let's do something uh, more interesting. I'll, Let's just mount that over home in Alpine so you can make sure that uh, it works. And so at this point, uh, if I do ls home uh, with this mounts file, um, oh yeah, so s-p was actually mounted in there. Let's do uh, home s-p and there's a couple files that are readable to the user namespace. So again, it's not showing a ton of content in there but a file name Fred was located in that folder. Um, but the problem is when I'm doing this, uh, one, of the, one of the trickiest problems with user namespaces is that because my process is running as an unprivileged user, 
usually the volume I'm mounting um, you know, doesn't have the right permissions. And now if I run multiple containers with different mappings, um, I can't you know, actually come up with, a, with uh, privileges and, and permissions that make sense. And that's pretty frustrating to a lot of user namespace uh, interested parties who want to use it in a broader way. And so what I'd like to kind of finish with um, is that uh, Linux Kit is an interesting way to try out new features in the Linux kernel. That's one use case of many. And so there is a shiftfs um, uh, patch set that is attempting to solve this, this problem of mounts um, inside a user namespace. And so what I've done is I've already, um, I've already uh, created a Linux kit assembly. Again, if you look in my GitHub project, I don't have time at this point to, to go through that. You'll see, um, you'll see the uh, um, Linux kit directory and you'll see a YAML file in there called shiftfs. And that's, what, that's what's being used to build this uh, Linux kit image. There's also scripts to build that there. Uh, here you can see I'm running Linux kit. As I said, I'm already running my, uh, my own container, container D here um, that example CTR is using. Um, so if I run example CTR2 here, uh, if you look in that YAML file, I created two users, Bob and Alice. They have different, um, they have different uh, UID mappings. So if I run a container uh, for Bob, um, we should see a container was created. And if we uh, look at that one, uh, PID 1094, it's running as UID 100,000. If we look at sub UID, we can see that's Bob's range. Um, if I go over here and run another one with uh, Alice, And I now have this other um, container running with PID 1170. You can see that's running with UID 200,000. Now what if I mount the same volume into each of their containers um, or bind mount a directory from the host? They're not gonna have permissions to access that. Um, I was gonna show both modes where I couldn't have access and where I could, but we're running out of time pretty quickly. So let me kill these, um, these tasks. If you'll give me a minute to type. Um, and just remove the containers just to make the output clear when we start the other ones. Linux kit isn't being friendly to my uh, output here, but that's fine. Um, so at this point, I should have no containers running. As I said, the example CTR2 looks for a mounts file. So if I do mounts shift FS and copy that here to where I'm gonna run it. And we look at this, um, this file, you can see it's gonna take home uh, from their var external volume. Again, this is inside my Linux kit VM. Use the shift FS driver that I built into Linux kit and mount that on home in the container. Um, so now if we start Bob's container um, and we start Alice's container from here, we have both of them running. Um, I've got a simple script that, so I don't have to type the whole command, but uh, if I go, in, if I exec into those containers, so I'm gonna go into, I think this is Bob's, the first one I started. And I look at home. It's empty right now, uh, but if I touch a file, I can actually, um, I can do that. And it actually looks like it's owned by root here. We'll go, obviously we can go out into var external home. Uh, sorry, external volume. And we can see that that was actually created with UID 100,000, 100,000, which is uh, Bob's ID within the container. Uh, obviously we can do the same thing in Alice's container. Um, 
Let's look 1404. As I'm running out of time, my typing is getting worse and worse. So we can actually see Fred, but he's, he doesn't match any ID in our container, so he's assigned the nobody user. Uh, I'm going to um, touch Alice in here. Was I in home? Let's do that again. And if we go back to var external volume, we can see that that was created with 200,000, 200,000. So again, I've had to rush uh, through this part because we're basically out of time. Uh, but again, shift FS is giving us a way to do that um, without being blocked by the permissions. Shift FS needs more work upstream, but Linux Kit gives us an easy way to play with those features. And with my containerd client, I can actually try out those features. Um, so a few final slides. There are some resources here. I'll post these slides in, uh, as soon as uh, we're out of this talk. Uh, if you want to see more interesting uses of the API beyond kind of what I've just showed you, look at CRI Container D. You can look at my Bucket Bench project, which has a Container D driver using the same API. You can look at Lib Container D in the Mobi project. These are all users of the API. Uh, obviously, above here, the Getting Started Guide and the GoDoc are also great resources. Uh, so with that, I think I am more than over with time. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and time. Thanks.